Our next speaker is Dr. Robin Murphy. She's professor in the Departments of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M University. As with other presentations, we'll have a few minutes for question and answer after her presentation. Please welcome Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Stephen. Well, I'm from Texas A&M. Howdy. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about AI robots and disasters. And what an important topic. Every year in the United States, $125 billion in direct cost. And guess what? Texas is number one. We're number one, both in the economic impact and the number and diversities of the types of disasters that we see. And I've been working in disaster since 1995. I'm a computer scientist. I work in AI and robotics, but I apply it starting with the World Trade Center to disasters. I tell people I've been in 31 disasters, not of my own making. Okay, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. And you know, I'm, you know sit on boards and all the, the normal things that we do. But one of the things I'm really excited about is that I'm part of, our Texas A&M is part of the NSF AI Institute on AI for societal decision making. And I lead the disasters thrust. That's an important societal decision where AI could help. Healthcare is the other one. So those are the two focus. All right, so about now, you're probably thinking the outline. You know, you got it, OK. Um, I'm going to be talking about robots. I'll be advances and legged robots. You know, maybe, maybe a little skinny about what's going on with Optimus over at Tesla, uh, how that's going to change things. You know, computer vision, all that great work that we've seen in the California wildfires. That's great. We're going to have that. We're just right there. And we're going to have a couple of startup companies. Going to be really nice nexus here in Texas. And how great Texas A&M and the great research we're doing there. That's not that talk, OK? We're going in a different direction with that, and, and some reasons for that. So first off, I'm not going to have time to talk about this here, but the legged and, and humanoid robots, brilliant, wonderful work, not what we see in emergency response, because the value add is not duplicating humans. It's smaller, different, things that we can't do. It's a system. Uh, if we look at computer vision, well, yes, wonderful. I mean, I'm be talking about computer vision and machine learning, but that's not the only one. This is not a one technology thing. This is a complex process, so there's a lot of things going on. And all the computer vision, machine learning stuff that you've seen successful, wonderful, wonderful, very brittle, very sensor specific, very that doesn't transfer, but there's a lot of great things to do. So it is not just, you know, plug and jog. And then another thing that I want you to take away from is that even though we're talking about disasters, the same fundamental things that we're learning for disasters is important and can add contributions to other areas, such as medicine. Anything with images, we'll, we'll walk away there. And then in terms of Texas AM, yes, I am talking about that. <laughs> All right. So let's go through. A disaster happens. What are the big questions, those so societal impact questions? Well, locally, they're pretty obvious. What just happened? How do I get resources? How do I find the people who are in need? How do I get resources to them? How do I do that later on? So I've got allocation and ingress. And let's see how, uh, in this case, drones can help with that. This is Harvey, Fort Bend County. The Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue at Texas A&M's Engineering Experiment Station has been working with Fort Bend County Office of Emergency Management to provide small unmanned systems, aerial vehicles, and even marine vehicles to be looking at the uh, underneath bridges and the river. What we've been doing is providing small unmanned aerial systems primarily to give aerial imagery so that the officials can see what they're doing to make real-time decisions. We believe this is the largest formal deployment by public officials of small unmanned aircraft systems for disaster response in our nation's history. These drone platforms working from different elevations have provided our local emergency management team with aerial photography at multiple scales and in high resolution. We have the ability to adjust unmanned aircraft flights in real time to assist with search and rescue operations or changing flood conditions. 
The teams were comprised of federal, state, and private organizations and agencies from across the United States, all working together to help the citizens of Fort Bend County, Texas. So that shows a little bit of what drones do. You can see those eye in the sky that you control, you the local agencies can get information from. Now at the strategic level, at the state and federal level, taking all that information and trying to figure out essentially how to pay for it, very important. How much money do you need? What the check that you can go ahead and start spending against for these recovery operations. So let's get into eye chart land. I am so sorry. I, we, the, this is a classic data to decision diagram. And so we can think of these as the red diamonds or our decisions that we're looking at. You're seeing that going from, going from this side, the locals are trying to figure out the, the who needs what, how to get to them, the damage, the debris. We're going to take all that, pull those together in these reports, get them off to the state and federal, and then voila, the, the feds are going to give us money uh, for that to reimburse and get things, and, and the resources and stuff to go with that. So that's the basic idea there. Now, it's, there's really a lot more going on, particularly at the tactical level. I mean, this is, this, these are not trivial decisions, trying to decide who needs what, how much the emergency services are there. Let's get these people dispatched, the teams, the resources, and that and the damage and debris, and you're using drone imagery from your local teams and agencies to figure that out. Okay, let's, okay, and then we did a little, got a little too excited here. Um, okay, so there's a lot more going on with that, and then we can see that idea about just a simple problem. Can I see people are need in trouble? I know this group is hit hard. This vulnerable community, how do I get to them? So this is from Hurricane Michael. We're flying a small fixed wing. Uh, most of the things that we fly are in the, uh, with the exception of that big in situ one that landed into the, to the crane, into the, the tripwire, uh, are about a couple to $3,000 of that. Well, notice that everything's not too bad in terms of getting things in until you get to that bridge. And once you see that, there's no going around that one. So now we immediately called back to say, if you're trying to get anybody to the east side of Mexico Beach, you're going to have to take the four hour route up north and then come down because you're not gonna get it any other way. All right, and we would love to exploit multimodal systems. Things like what is the satellite data that we're getting? What is the NOAA overhead imagery getting? All of that. Unfortunately, we don't actually have control of that. If you're a tactical person down there, you may or may not get that. Satellites, a lot of times with hurricanes, their clouds in the way uh, causes that. And then it just keeps getting worse, right? Because now you have more decisions to make. So if you're, you're, you or those local trying to deploy those drones to get that imagery, you've got to figure out what the missions, what the allocations are. This. So you get an eye chart like this. And so when I see an eye chart like that, I say, AI can help. Now, of course, we have the deep suspicion AI can make it worse, but in this case, I think it can. And so this is what we're trying to focus on. Uh, and if you look, if you look at this, you can, it's like a Rorschach test for those of us in AI of where you can put it in. You can start seeing uh, learning policies and communication. What's the best way to respond to these things quicker and how to allocate those resources? But certainly on the right, how do you handle the uncertainty in these predictions, the simulations of the game? Uh, generative AI, you can't believe how much that helps in trying to get some of these reports summarized and written, creating PowerPoints turns out to be a major function during a disaster, believe it or not. But the three that I want to concentrate on this talk will be computer vision, machine learning, uh, human robot interaction and planning and planning and scheduling. And let's let's go through uh, just them getting to computer vision, machine learning is the favorite. So I'm gonna get to that last. All right, so planning and scheduling. So you know allocation. Sure, right, people are hurt, people are this, I need to get resources to them, I need resources to discover them, I need to get resources to them. And that. We have a lot of history of AI in 
logistics and in these sorts of things. Disasters make it worse, though, because besides all of those types of resource allocation, who's getting water, who, where we stand of the shelters, we have huge amount of things to look at. So when you have a disaster, not only are you trying to save people, you also have got to figure out, oh my gosh, we got to get the water back on. What's the state of the wastewater treating plant? What about the sewage lift stations? What about the bridges? What about this? What about, oh, wouldn't it be great for recovery if we went ahead and prioritized opening all the county offices where you get the building permits. So that gives you, in Hurricane Irma, we had to search and document 1,500 of those critical infrastructure things. And so clearly doing that faster than sending a team of person to drive to each one, doing it with drones, gives you a huge time advantage. And at Hurricane Ian, the National Geospatial Agency, they use computer vision. They can, at those altitudes, you can only say building there, building not there. Uh, things are wrong here. They came up for Hurricane Ian 53,000 points that the urban search and rescue teams had to go look at. So how do we do that with drones? That's, this is like a traveling salesman problem on steroids. OK, and so now we have to figure those out and working, uh, enjoying working with Howie Chosis and uh, Siva Rathanam at uh, Carnegie Mellon and, and, and Texas A&M as well. Human-robot interaction. And of course, Kim Hambrooken will be talking more about that later. But here for our work, why would you care about human-robot interaction? We're talking about societal decisions. Well, you know, somebody's flying those drones. And guess what happens? Turns out flying drones isn't like doing a little cute two hours for a toy and doing video for a game or something. No, no, no. One day, uh, we're showing the pilots, and these are experienced pilots, are legally drunk from the stress. And guess what? It bounces back, but just a little with sleep. And oh, wait, for the first 52 hours of disaster, you're not sleeping. Oh, yay. Yay, team. OK. So a little bit of things there. So that's some of the stuff we've been working with with uh, Rajan Ameda and Camille Perez. Now, let's get to computer vision and machine learning, you know, the really big, hot, you know, hot, hot in, in AI. And, and it's great. Uh, so we're going to talk, you know, because you've got all of these advances that we've seen in the last two years. We're going to just put them over. And it's like we're just, we can just take computer vision and take those advances and like fairy dust, just put them there. And, and that's what uh, my great grad students, uh, led by Tom and Zini, are, are working on. And, you know, and, and we, you know, there's some nice stuff. So we talked about that problem of ingress, of, of roads. Well, look what we've got here. Here's, uh, this is from Hurricane Ian, some of our latest data. Okay, you've got roads that are covered by water. Here we've annotated, we've overlaid the road map in gray, and then red is bad, okay? And you know, pretty in there, we train the model, and here's what it outputs. And it's even more fun because it's it's giving a little bit better than what we gave it. Very cool, by the way. That is a demo version. There's some atrocities in there for the cherry picking uh, with that. But so we've got a huge promise, though. Doesn't that look great? Well, this is wonderful if you can solve four fundamental problems. One is you need data. You need annotated data. Disasters are fairly rare, and they've always got something different. Uh, classic nonlinear dynamic system. Alignment, that overlaying the roads is hard. Unclear schemas. What is the actual decision you want to make? As we saw with Chris's talk about, about what is your stakeholder? What do they really want out of this? Answer, short answer is, how heck if we know. And multi-view, what do you do with these different sensors, different resolutions? Quit trying to train your model to work with one drone and one satellite or one modality. What do you do with those? All right, so let's talk about what we're doing to try to solve these problems to make this work for disasters. And the first thing is we're leveraging all of those disasters that the Center for Roboticists Search and Rescue have been at. We've got a huge sets of data. We are building the largest annotated database ever largest on any dimension you want to. We've got 10 disasters, you know, hurricanes, including volcanoes. Nobody has volcanoes, OK, in there. We were at Kilauea. OK, but how do you do the problem? It's not so much data. How do you annotate it? Well, very fortunate. We work with a lot of high schools. And it turns out high school students think anything, including very 
detailed annotation is more interesting than whatever their high school teacher is talking about at the time. And so we can merge that in, and we're very proud. 151 students have been working on this, have done, have done about 82% of our data set is now complete on, on different labels, and three of those are from low income, uh, high risk high schools. Uh, so we're very, very pleased with that, and they're very excited. We have some that, that uh, very interested in, in, in computer science as a result. Now, let's talk about alignment. That seems like that would be interesting. That's one of those, isn't this, I mean, we're all using GPS, we're all doing this, how hard could this be? Oh my gosh, this turns out to be not trivial. So you see where the little overlay doesn't match the roads. Well, okay, how do we do that now in computer vision with all the great you know, results we've seen so far? You do it manually. Well, that's why some of these re great results show up six months after a disaster, because you get, we gotta get this done in real time, so we have to automate that, because we're getting on the order of 60 gigabytes of images that we gotta pop the road overlay over so it can tell us are the polygon for the building, so the machine learning can tell us thumbs up, thumbs down. So that's something we've gotta solve. Now, and this is any of y'all in transportation, civil, transportation stuff? Rats, because we need professional help here. Uh, so this is one of the things, you look in that orange, you're beginning to see, look at that, that's an area, it's a road, it's covered, so, you know, that, but how bad is that? Is that like super deep sand? Does it kind of looks like maybe you could get through it? You know, do you want to mark that as all bad? Do you want to do that? So we don't know, and uh, you know, is that, you know, certainly you're not going down that with a Prius, right? But you know, can you do it with a big four-wheel drive vehicle? And so we don't really, it turns out there is no real standards for that. The Army has lots of things for driving tanks, but it doesn't do a nice, nice crossover. So that's an, that's an area. Multi-view, same bridge damage from, yeah, this is Ian, from Hurricane Ian. Uh, but at different resolutions. The best you can get, one with the drone, one with the manned uh, overflight, high altitude overflights from NOAA, and one from the Maxar satellites. Well, the Maxar satellites really can't, can tell you, yeah, that's kind of fuzzy. So when do you use one versus the other? Can you use one to say, go, we need to go grab that data from there? Can you cross train them? All of those sorts of things go there, okay? And so I wanna wrap, start wrapping this up, is that really, what to me is fascinating, and what I hope is of interest to you, it's not so much, there is this important impact societally, but these are the exact same problems we see in any science that is using imagery. You've got to do these same problems of trying to apply that meteorology, microscopy, these sorts of things. And so we feel that by solving these problems under, <laughs> you know, duress uh, for these things will aid in general. And then another thing I wanna leave you with that, so imagine what happens as we start to improve things like modality translation in computer vision machine learning. What does that mean? Now, what if I live in a world where I can cross train, I can train my models on satellite data, I get drone data, but I can also do it with their synthetic aperture, and I can do it with thermal, and I can do that. Well, what happens if I start flying at night? If I use thermal imagery, engineer civils, we can't use it, it's too fuzzy. And also human, we don't, we can't quite get the mapping right. But if I've trained these models correctly, we may be able to grab and then project what it looks like as if it were daylight. And so now we don't do a lot of flying, we don't do a lot of processing, even with satellites, at night but we could suddenly have a game changer. And back to Chris's point, we've got a human in the loop. We're always assisting and trying to help with that. So to wrap up, uh, I want you to walk away with, it's not, the robots and AI, it's not about replacing responders or our emergency managers, it's about extending and assisting what they do. And we definitely need more than one type of AI, lots of AI to go through that data decision process. And of course, computer vision, machine learning is, is exciting because it's really that foundation from taking things, decisions that take th three days to two weeks to do and getting it down to three hours. And that can make a huge, 
huge difference in people's lives, their lives and their livelihoods. And then, but we do need fundamental advances in computer vision and beyond the, the you know, what's the best architecture? Oh yeah, I love them. Okay, whatever. You know, there's a lot of hard problems and hard work still to be done there. But whatever we do, we know that uh, I believe it can be of useful to the entire community, scientific community, but it, most importantly, all of this great work, like all the work that we're all trying to do, it's all about saving lives and livelihoods. So with that, we'll finish up, but if you, you do have interest in this, please contact me. And also I brought some copies of my books if you want to, you know, like nerdy robot books, uh, see me at the break and I'll give you a copy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. We have time for a couple questions, a couple microphones there. Uh, one jumps to my mind is that, you know, the traditional, my thought of a response to an emergency operation is all the, you know, power crews go down there and, and you know, a lot of mechanical type systems go. Are you taking now a team of uh, technologists and AI people with you uh, when you go out? Well, that's an, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, the ethics, Back to Peter Stone, and then the ethics are no, you don't take a large number of people. You are evacuated. You, you are stressing the systems. I am actually a trained responder. So I was actually certified Florida uh, Task Force 3. Uh, so, and, and when we fly, it's typically with like state of Florida as part of UAS 1. Uh, so there. So you have that, so it's, and, and that is a really interesting part of the problem of data acquisition, is that you just can't show up with 28 people. To, to these types of things. Yes, sir. Hi, Robin. Uh, Rob Ambrose, Texas A&M, formerly NASA. <clears throat> so I'm all, all interested in different forms of robots, really exciting, you know, all the different problems that you faced. Uh, over the years, we've talked about uh, different uh, approaches for getting down into rubble and other things. Can you give us your latest, what, what you think the best options are out there and, you know, beyond the old camera on a stick, you know, what you, are you starting to finally see some things that can can get into the into the rubble piles. So no, we're not seeing things to get into the rubble pile, but there are promising technologies. So most recent, the most recent building collapse I've been at was the Surfside collapse, and so you saw probably saw pictures of oh look, the spot leg robot dog can go on top of rubble. No one cares. No one cares. No one cares. What you're trying to do is get more than 20 feet below the surface. And at Surfside, there were nine people who did not die of crush syndrome. So that meant they, they were potentially survived and trapped, but they were about 60 feet in the rubble. So how do you get in there? And by the way, so we took, uh, took advantage of the drones flying every day, three times a day, and getting complete maps, 3D elevation maps, and treated those like layers of tomography. So you're taking the slices and putting them together, where were the voids? And what is the size, the appropriate size for a robot to be? It's not a big dog size, it's not a person size, it's not a dog size, it's sort of a weasel size. Uh, so I like snakes with legs, kind of a you know, sneaky, weaselly thing, ferret to get in there looking to get in those. And then they also need to be a bit like a sand uh, lizard where they can scoop and dig in because the, the voids to get down to a place that's survivable is not necessarily a complete tunnel. So you have to move stuff around. And then now you've got dirt in your face and now you've got that. So it's a huge mechanical, it's a, a robotics thing. We're seeing some exciting work in soft robots, both the kind that you just inflate and put it in there and go, I had one, and I'll be speaking at the Soft Robotics Conference uh, later this spring, but I had one of the top teams doing beautiful work come to me and they say, okay, this could be used for search and rescue. And, you know, we've, we've looked at your dimensions and all the characterizations you've done, and it can do this and this. Where's the money? And it's like, money? Disaster response? I'm sorry, what? And they said, no, you know, we're a startup company. We got to do this. You know, robots are expensive. It takes a lot of people. You know, we got to do this. Where's the money? Where, where's the, the business plan? And it's like, okay, it's a low volume, low profit uh, industry. You know, that's, that's one of the things, anything is with emergency response. And, and, and so that was supposed to be an hour conversation. That was 30 minutes. They just 
hey, good to see you. Hey, beautiful weather. We're moving on now. So that's one of the challenges we face. And that also is a, a challenge for y'all, as, as this is that where, where do we step in uh, to, to make things that won't happen under normal funding or initiatives and things like that? So that was a long answer. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Rob. We, we have time for one more question. Thank you so much, Robin. So um, you did mention about uh, the algorithms, traveling salesman, getting access to the data. Um, the communication infrastructure would also collapse. How do you build that into your algorithm design, and especially, especially in, the, in terms of formal modeling? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it collapses. It's not there. How do you build it in? You assume there is no communication, because there, there, there won't be. Uh, and then we, we uh, our data from, we, we've shown this throughout, but our most recent data from, from Ian showed us from day one, even with all of FirstNet and all of the great stuff, was zero. There was no connectivity and no bandwidth. On day two, we started getting connectivity, but, but no bandwidth. By that, by day three, we got some connectivity and bandwidth, but we can show how we went into a four hour lag of trying to upload these things just to get the maps built. So if you're trying to push things to the, uh, to the cloud to get this, these large amount, you know, 60, 20 gigabytes of data to be put together, if you're not doing it in the field, if you're not doing edge computing, it's not gonna work. Our, the solution uh, is sneaker net. We were running teams to, to take the data over to the nearest intact emergency operations center with a, a, a high-speed internet that we could do it that way and bring it back. So a lot of work with that. Texas A&M's Interop, uh, Inter IT, uh, ITech2 uh, Center does that, and there'll be a big exercise. Uh, fun fact, just, just as a fun fact, when we did after 9-11, we started this huge uh, Department of Commerce thing to improve communications after disaster. All of the assumptions were made voice. Voice over IP was the critical communication. What they didn't realize, how much imagery, how much data we're trying to do. We can't even stream in these conditions. And Starlink can only, wasn't able to carry the load. We had been this. So it's a big thing, and it's a, a subtle problem. Thank you. Okay, please join me in thanking Dr. Murphy again.